It was a risky strategy. And if the fountains want to be dried up... That if one appeared in front of the Lord Chancellor, one was certainly going to risk at least a tongue lashing and probably something much worse. Gentlemen, I will say to you what the scriptures say. Go your way and sin no more. Lest a worse fate befalls thee. Newton lost his battle, but the very next year the Catholic king was forced to flee the country. Newton the alchemist and secret heretic was catapulted into public life. He was elected an MP for Cambridge. But the lure of the crucible kept him chained to his furnace. Finally in 1693, God's ultimate secret seemed tantalizingly within his reach. He watched, transfixed, as gold mixed with a special mercury seemed to swell before his eyes. Was this the philosopher's stone? He tried the experiment again and again, but he was wrong. The experiment had failed. He realized that this was the end of the struggle. I think there's no question that he was disappointed because he was looking for ultimate answers to questions. And he had failed in alchemy as he had not failed in any other pursuit. There were other tensions. Newton had grown very close to a brilliant young mathematician and alchemist, Nicola Fatio de Duilier. Pray. Let me know by line or two whether you can have lodgings for both in the same house at present, or whether you would have me take some other lodgings. I am yours, most affectionately to serve you. But in 1692, Fatio, a hypochondriac, wrote to tell Newton that he was dying. I last night received your letter, with which how much I was affected, I cannot express. Pray, procure the advice and assistance of physicians before it be too late. And, and if you want any money, I will supply you. Sir, with my prayers for your recovery I rest your most affectionate and faithful friend to serve you. I doubt that Newton had a physical relationship with Fatio, but it, it's quite clear from the correspondence be between them that these caused Newton to become uh, emotionally disturbed. Fatio lived. But a year later, this relationship disintegrated. Newton then had a breakdown, accusing his few friends of misdeeds of which they were entirely innocent. He wrote to the diarist Samuel Pepys, president of the Royal Society. I'm extremely troubled at the embroilment I'm in. And have not slept well this twelve month, nor have my former consistency of mind. I never designed to get anything by your interest, nor by King James's favour. But I'm now sensible that I must withdraw from your acquaintance and see neither you nor my great friends any more. Newton also wrote an even more vicious letter to his friend, John Locke. Newton accused him of trying to... embroil me with women. And when told Locke was ill, wrote... "'Twere better if he were dead." Newton's friends forgave him, and he explained that he had been sick and had not slept for five nights. He was knackered. And the reason he was knackered is because he'd spent the, the last 
10 years, between say the early 1680s and the early 1690s, working all the hours that God sent, and it was Newton who thought that these were hours sent by God. If he had a breakdown, I think it was probably because of exhaustion. Newton also had to cope both with his emotional crisis over Fatio and his failure to grasp the golden prize alchemy once promised. And all the time, there was the haunting fear of being exposed as a heretic. But he recovered and began a new life. He moved permanently from the cloisters of Trinity to London. Newton now sought and gained money and power. He became president of the Royal Society and master of the Royal Mint, where he earned a fortune. But all the time, he guarded his dark secret. Right up to his death in 1727, he tried to keep his heresy as secret as possible, because the vast majority of people around him are Orthodox Anglicans, and he thinks there's no point trying to convince these people of, of what I'm doing because the time is not right. These people aren't fit to receive uh, the kind of word that I'm giving out. As he lay dying, Sir Isaac Newton, aged 84, finally revealed his double life. He made clear to startled friends the dangerous heretical belief that he had kept secret for 50 years. He refused to take the last sacrament. Sir Isaac, that was the time of the last sacrament. No. I will not die in the embrace of a corrupt church. I have made my peace with God. Newton had accomplished more than any scientist before him. But some of his achievements lay undiscovered in his hidden manuscripts. All his life, Newton had worked feverishly to uncover God's plans. In Jerusalem, where Newton was convinced Christ would one day return to destroy corruption and usher in a thousand years of peace and pure Christianity, Stephen Snowballin has unearthed a remarkable document. This shows that late in life, Newton decoded from the Bible the date he believed would see the beginning of the end of the world, the apocalypse. A manuscript like this really brings to life that Newton was a deeply religious man, more like a, a fundamentalist in, in many ways uh, than uh, many of us would, would, uh, would like to think. What he was trying to do is determine when the end would come, when Christ would return, when all the apocalyptic events of the end times would come to a head. The date for all the violence predicted in the book of Revelation. The date Newton prophesied for the apocalypse sits in our century, 2060.